Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of lectures in our group reading on Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. In the 16th lecture, we will examine the section of the text titled The Spiritual Animal Kingdom and Deceit, or the Matter in Hand Itself. Now, as you can see, that is a very long title talking about several different things at the same time, and it may not immediately be clear, even after you read this text the first time, um, what exactly all of that means, but of course, we will go through all of that in detail within this video, and the thing that I want to emphasize is, um, you may not know it just from looking at that very long and strange title, but this is actually the part of the text where Hegel explicitly deals with the same kind of thing, which Ted Kaczynski later called the power process. Now, of course, Hegel has a different word for it than that, but he's really talking about the same thing. And for that reason, this is um, an especially important part of the text for this school, where we have also invested so much in the past into studying the works of Kaczynski, especially Industrial Society and its future. The reason members of the school might want to consider doing this as their paper topic, remember that first paper back in February was supposed to be on um, something from the Unabomber Manifesto, well, maybe this, a sort of comparative analysis between Hegel and Kaczynski on the power process, that might be a good thing at least to consider and to discuss. So thank you once again, everybody who has joined the school. Um, once again, this is uh, at least two videos per week that we're doing. The first video for this week was uploaded the other day because I may be traveling for a few days this week at a place with no internet. At the very least, today, Sunday morning, the second video for this week um, has been released with this 16th lecture. So you might recall that the last video, we officially entered into this thing called Reason C, which is not just the final set of phases within Reason, but really the final definition of Reason itself. You might recall that we had initially defined Reason as um, observation in accord with the scientific method. That's basically the naive definition of Reason, which most people would accept. But when the scientific method itself was pushed all the way to its limit, all the way to the point of absurdity in the phrenology phrase, uh, phase, we did a one 80 and instead redefine reason as active. The problem with the phases of active rather than observing reason was not so much with the notion of being active, it was rather the irony that that activity failed to be actualized in quite the way that it was supposed to. And that was ultimately because of a misunderstanding about how the different faculties of the subject relate to one another. This reached its worst form with the Knight of Virtue arguing quite absurdly that the only way for people to become virtuous, given that by his phase of the phenomenology, virtue was no longer something that could originate in the law of the heart or from human nature, but rather was something with an objective, um, impersonal, and intrinsic goodness, which could only be instantiated within the human population if people first agreed to repress all of the individual idiosyncrasies, which, of course, make them who they are. In other words, you can only be the person you should be if you first get rid of the person that you really are. We transition beyond that into this final phase, C, precisely through having a reconciliation um, with that individual that you are, but also with the faculties of the human person himself or herself. And this was precisely because we had redefined reason not just as active, but rather as self-actualizing. The big difference is that actualization presupposes a certain symmetrical accord with the potentiality which preceded that act of actualization. A potentiality which, by the way, originates not just within the person in a mental sense of being within his or her mind, but rather originates from the person on a material level. It originates from the hardwired nature of that person and therefore allows us to rethink this same individuality which the Knight of Virtue argued had to be repressed, to rethink of it instead as a good in itself. The name for this good, which is a hardwired part of the unique and irreplaceable individual's nature, is of course a talent. And that is going to play a huge role, especially within the first set of phases within this section of the text.
By understanding reason as actualization to emerge from this hardwired potentiality which encompasses the whole person rather than just the mental part of that person, we've also arrived at a reconciliation between the higher spiritual qualities of the individual and those lower features of the person which traditionally had been labeled animal in nature. Understood on a social rather than merely individual level, this reconciliation between the highest and the lowest is really just the modern civil society. Now, if you really think about it, it's quite interesting that Hegel thought of talent, that is to say, the potential for greatness, which is only later actualized in so many publicly accessible works, um, in animal rather than purely spiritual terms. But one might argue that he did this in order to perhaps individualize the old Aristotelian idea of physis. Now, physis is a word from Greek that is transliterated as physics, but is really much closer to the idea of nature, not nature in the sense of a, a literal physical set of um, items out in the wild like trees and beavers and, you know, honeybees and things like that, but rather as um, the explanation for why a given thing does certain things simply as a matter of being the kind of thing that it is. For example, it has been argued that beavers don't really work. I mean, they build dams, of course, but that's just their nature to do that. All of the other things which beavers do, they do simply because it's their nature. The way that they eat, the way that they swim, the way that they mate, all of those are just different expressions of the same underlying beaver nature. And really, every um, stage within the morphological development of a given plant or animal, however young or old it might be, is itself just another manifestation of a single consistent and ultimately unified potentiality, which really is just their nature. Now, of course, Aristotle did not think that everything you see manifested is a result of such hardwired nature, for he used the word techne to describe those things which come to appearance rather as a result of a certain creative and willful intervention by an intelligent agent who uses a certain specialized knowledge to make those things appear by drawing on a set of skills which are supplementary even to the innate nature of that person person himself or herself. For example, any living thing has the ability to do things like, say, grow or feed, and depending on which living thing it is, it might be able to move and certainly to take in inputs from the five senses. These are just free abilities which were already included in its hardwired nature. In contrast with such free abilities, blacksmithing is a techne because one must go beyond one's natural abilities to acquire the skill of blacksmithing through a specialized training in that particular art. In contrast with Aristotle, though, Hegel, in this particular section of the phenomenology, seems to imply that these two things, that is to say a techne and fusis, might not be so easily separated after all. What if the creatively generated works of art are simply reflections of one's own innate nature, now understood to be simply the talent which a person had been endowed with as a matter of naturalistic happenstance? or perhaps if you accept the, the literal meaning of gift as a gift from God. But either way, this is almost like an individualized version of nature, now understood to be unique to one person rather than the same for the entire species, as would be the case for, say, beavers. It was perhaps for this very reason that Hegel quite literally titled this section the spiritual animal kingdom. Controversial as such a claim might be, describing talent as something like an individualized version of human nature really does make sense when you consider that we all have different talents and each of us is only really in his or her own element when we get to use the talent that spontaneously emerged in ourselves without having to be artificially placed there by anyone else. Happiness, it would seem, is simply the right to get to be oneself, that is to say, to be in one's own element in accord with one's hardwired talent, rather than just be forced to fill some generic placeholder for, out, for how everyone should be, as the Knight of Virtue had mistaken 
mistakenly believe. We have this idea that you have to follow your calling. That is to say, live your life in your element with the talent you just happen to be endowed with, rather than follow some other career just for the money, just for the prestige, just because your parents wanted you to do it, etc. Promising as this might seem, if one ultimately considers the implications of such an arrangement on a collective and social level rather than a merely individual one, one cannot avoid the logical conclusion that this stage will literally posit self-absorption, <laughs> that is to say being absorbed in your element from your hardware talent, as a presupposition for all activity, not just the individual activity of getting to do one's own thing, but even interaction with the other. Such a society will inevitably devolve into a venue for fierce competition, which will reveal it to be still stuck in a pre-ethical phase of the phenomenology, but before we get to that, we will um, go through each of these phases to see how exactly that arises as a matter of irony. The three phases of this um, particular section are, of course, first, considering the work as a product of my nature, second, considering instead the universal matter in hand itself, and finally, arriving at the uncomfortable situation of a universalized deceit. Paragraph 397 opens this section by noting that any attempt to understand the individual outside the concrete application of that individuality through work will only leave one stuck at the level of the idealist category. This was a view of the human subject entertained in a section 7 as what Kant described as a certain filter through which the world appears in a distorted manner to a solipsistic subject who is definitely outside of that world. Um, that is an unsatisfactory view of the human individual because that gives you a type of universality which is merely abstract and which inevitably falls apart upon closer examination. Paragraph 398 notes that in contrast with that, the real individual is not simply the empty transcendental category, but rather an individual with an original determinate nature. Paradoxically, although such a unique personal nature is defined by a set of definite qualitative limits, consciousness does not experience these as limitations on its free action, for these are precisely what enable it to act in its own idiosyncratic way. More specifically, Hegel noted that consciousness only finds itself relating to itself through these limits rather than experience them as an other, let alone as a negative obstacle to its behavior. Contrary to expectation, it is not mystical idealism, but rather one's status as a human animal, which allows one to embody such a unity of life through one's own nature. By paragraph 399, though, we find that the end of my act is just my own nature, but despite the circularity of this view of action, you still paradoxically have to really act in order to make this formula more than a meaningless logical tautology. In other words, despite the fact that I already am my own destination, I still have to go through the process of traveling there. But wait a minute, if we're talking about a process involving a goal for which arriving at the result without crossing the threshold into action would defeat its own purpose, we have just unwittingly stumbled upon Hegel's view of the power process as described by Ted Kaczynski in the Unabomber Manifesto. You might recall that Kaczynski used the allegory of a man who could get whatever he desired without actually working for it. For example, he was given a magical ability to simply wish good food into existence or beautiful women or whatever. Um, such a person would not have more satisfaction than the guy who actually had to work for it. He would um, be fundamentally ruled out from satisfaction and would be driven into a state of insanity. This um, was adopted in an early episode of The Twilight Zone in which a criminal was gunned down by police while robbing a store, only to find that he ended up in his favorite place, a casino, in which somehow, whereas it was very difficult to win in a casino in the real world, um, in this one he wins every time. He's surrounded by beautiful women who, once again, kind of hard to get victories in that arena um, in the real world, but here he wins every time. He finds himself actually begging the casino owner to let him lose some of the time, that at least then he would have a sense of excitement and suspense, not knowing whether he would really get it this time because then he'd have to work for it. 
Um, he finds, though, that he's not really in heaven after all, for hell is exactly the place in which the power process is impossible, but power is something that really is guaranteed. This paradox in which power without the power process really is not good enough is something which Hegel himself also dealt with in his own way in this section of the text. While Kaczynski had listed the three essential factors of the power process as the establishment of a goal followed by the exertion of effort towards that goal, and finally the attainment of the goal, Hegel also listed three eerily similar components of his own version of the power process. Hegel noted that in the course of acting in accord with one's nature, action itself shifts from first an end thought of as a purely subjective object. This subjective object is a hypothetical idea deal understood at that moment to be actively opposed to the state of reality as it really is. This then becomes a transition as such, understood to be the means to that end, before finally becoming the end as fully realized. But for that very reason, now a fully independent other lying beyond the consciousness which created it. The irony, in other words, is that my end ceases to be mine at the exact moment that I finally succeed in fully realizing it. As Kaczynski would later explain, this is why surrogate activities require infinite constant repetition, which will basically continue repeating on an infinite loop until one quite literally drops dead. This is because even something as quote-unquote important or difficult as scientific research can never really happen enough times. If a scientist solves one problem, he will inevitably adopt another one, not because that other problem actually is inherently better than the one he just solved, but simply because he needs another surrogate active, he needs to go through the power process with all of its essential components one more time. In that sense, what is being repeated is not only one phase, but rather the whole process, a single unified pattern which will cease to be what it is if it is deprived of any essential component. In paragraph 401, Hegel concludes that the paradoxical status of the first stage of the power process as, once again, a purely subjective object or the mere imagination of some hypothetical scenario in the future, which is explicitly understood to be at odds with the unsatisfactory state of affairs in the present moment, this um, subjective object reveals the subject's own original nature to be the real starting point of the whole power process. Yet, for that very reason, that personalized individual nature will continue to be reflected later on, even in the finished work itself, and even within the execution of the process on a moment-by-moment -moment basis in the second phase. We all accept this without really realizing it, though, by agreeing that every painting of Van Gogh is just one more reflection of the original talent unique to that man. They are all works of Van Gogh because Van Gogh's genius is something which is, in a certain sense, more universal um, than any one particular work which he left behind. This introduces, however, a certain chicken and egg paradox because on the one hand, my action manifests my innate nature, but on the other, I can only even begin to know what my innate nature is through first examining my actions, which alone are publicly visible even to me myself. Ironically, it is precisely because I have now reached the dialectical reconciliation with my own actions as expressions of my innate nature that they become even my only way to know myself, which can, of course, only happen after the fact. I can only begin that after the power process has been gone through and that finished product has been externalized and made into an object of, once again, observation. Yet even more troubling than the paradox that I can only even begin to observe myself as subject through first observing the external object, which we determined earlier was 
by definition, not me. Well, even worse than that is the realization that there's not only one object anyway, there's a plurality of them, as any artist has a number of different works, any performer has a number of different performances. And despite the fact that action in the power process never goes outside of itself, in which case, of course, all of the moments are contained within a unity, the performances themselves are still distinct from one another, and not by far all equal in quality. We all know what it's like to scratch our heads watching the legends of rock and roll or American country music screw up the live performance of their own original songs on stage, in a very strange case of failing to cover themselves. In fact, Judas Priest literally hired a guy from a Judas Priest tribute band to replace Rob Halford himself when they were amazed that this guy had spent so much time imitating the metal god that he basically sounded more like Halford than he himself did. On a properly philosophical level, by paragraph 402, Hegel ha asks how exactly one could compare all of these performances unless one had already presupposed that the original nature of the subject enjoyed a privileged position outside all of these performances, a position of both artist but also as critic who could evaluate even his own performances and works of art. Paragraph 403 explained that a person's actions, including such performances, can be judged as good or bad only in comparison with some presupposed standard. But that standard is not any one action which would serve as an ideal example which all of the others fall short of, as you might naively think. Rather, the standard to which these performances um, are compared is simply the original nature of the subject himself or herself. While it is true that Shania Twain's performances have fallen short in recent years of what we saw when she was in her prime in, say, the 1990s, it is not the performances in the 90s to which these should be compared. It is rather her own talent as a musician, which was much better exemplified in the 1990s than anything she has done for many years since then. Hegel explains that on a logical level, this is because while only one product of the uh, power process can be considered at a time as something so singular as to become just an inert and alien thing, only consciousness itself always maintains the character of a certain universality which can even step back from its own works in order to compare them critically. But even if we accept that consciousness is universal in contrast with the singularity of the externalized work, is it really so unbiased as to be a perfectly reliable judge, especially of works that it had been involved with creating in the past? Won't I have a tendency to treat my own works differently from others, precisely out of the philosophical realization that my works equals my talent and my talent equals me? Well, by paragraph 405, things become even more complicated as even this formula comes to be called into question. If consciousness enjoys this privileged status of the judge of particular works only because of its own negativity in contrast with the fixed inner positivity of the works, it logically follows that it thus goes beyond itself in the work and is itself the qualityless void which is left unfilled even by the work itself, to quote Hegel. The work, too, then ultimately dissolves into all the other works, like the forces of electricity we saw in section three and gets lost as a vanishing element rather than a perfect reflection of my own hardwired nature. In other words, the kind of individuality which is exhibited by the work is that of a vanishing force rather than a satisfactorily achieved thing. By paragraph 406, an antithesis between doing and being emerges, contradicting the earlier idea that talent could be defined simply as the unity of subject and object, insofar as my subjective talent could be embodied into a finished work which would externalize all of my interior properties into the publicly accessible characteristics of a thing. Now, instead, even the unity of the moments of the power process are called into question and visibly falls apart in paragraph 407. 
Reason reassures itself by paragraph 408 that the experience of the contingency of the action is itself only a contingent experience. This is just a fancy way of saying that the failure, which seems so catastrophic, must be re-evaluated as itself only a contingent failure, in which case the vanishing which occurred within it itself recursively vanishes, something which paragraph 409 claims lies in the notion of the intrinsically real individuality also. As we enter the second general phase of this section of the text, we then redefine the work no longer as a simple unity of my subjective talent and my objective result, but rather as a matter in hand. This is, though, one of the most mysterious concepts in the entire book and is perhaps a little more comprehensible in translation than it would be in the original German, as Hegel used the term Sache selbst, or more literally, the matter itself. By paragraph 410, we find that this matter in hand is a basic unit of practical life because its interfusion of both subjective and objective elements allows consciousness to behold as substance just itself, but in a much more meaningful way than the work which reflects the artist's talent had done. This is because the work was revealed to be a singular result which may be compared with many others, but the matter itself is by definition a universal, yet at the same time something objective. Unlike the purely subjective universal which the artist's creativity turned out to be and for that very reason was proven to be not the same as any one particular work, this objectively universal matter in hand is one which consciousness must deal with in a manner that is symmetrically universal. Hegel calls the proper stance towards the universality of the matter in hand as a stance of honesty in which consciousness attains to the idealism which the matter in hand expresses and possesses the truth in it qua this formal universality, as I quote Hegel himself. Hegel notes in much clearer terms that such a one who is honest in his dealings with the matter in hand is a quote-unquote consciousness which is concerned solely with the matter in hand and therefore busies itself solely with the various moments or species of it. And when it does not attain the matter in hand in one of these moments or in one meaning, it for that very reason gets hold of it in another. This is a movement within the universal genus, which really does reflect the proper mode of dealing with a universal objectivity rather than a mere particular to which we had been limited thus far. So what does this movement within the universal genus actually amount to within practice? Well, let's just recall that in the first phase of this section, a work like, say, a painting was seen as nothing more than a simple externalization of the inner talent of the artist. At that phase, we understood that insofar as a given great painter like, say, Van Gogh had a special specialized knowledge to paint, that was seen as merely accidental in comparison with his own individualized human nature, which had basically already predetermined him to be a great painter. But now, in contrast, painting is seen as a much broader subject matter which any given painter, even the greatest in history, must explore as an objectively universal sphere of knowledge extending far beyond the limits of their own hardwired abilities or their own knowledge of it. It is quite interesting that the greatest novelists of all time certainly did have talent, nobody denies that, but they also invested a lot of time in studying the subject matter of fiction itself. You might consider Balzac's intense rereadings of Dante in order to basically rewrite Dante's divine comedy as his own human comedy, or you might consider William Faulkner's tradition of rereading Don Quixote by Cervantes once a year. Painting, understood as a universal genus which must be explored rather than as a simple expression of my own talent, therefore ceases to be my painting, but rather becomes something which I must approach with an attitude of honesty. By paragraph 413, this radical shift in emphasis away from my own innate talent to instead this 
much bigger universal thing beyond myself allows one to excuse one's own imperfections or failures to perform quite as perfectly as the ideal because it's no longer myself that I'm falling short of, but rather the universal. And in this case, these failures and imperfections are not so big a deal so long as I at least made an honest effort in the process. An emphasis on effort uh, which eventually becomes totally detached from the results themselves and is explained with the strange metaphor Hegel provides of naughty boys who actually get a sick enjoyment out of having their ears boxed as punishment for something they did because at least they had a certain part in bringing about this undesirable effect through their own efforts. By paragraph 415, however, it is ultimately found that even this honest intent is something of an illusion. The agent is not quite as honest as he seemed to be, because the gap between a supposedly sincere intent on the inside and the set of dealings with the external universally objective matter in hand opens up a window of opportunity for deceit to become inevitable. Because the honest intent is by definition private, there will be a plurality of interpretations of it by people who lack the privileged status to see it exactly as it really is. It is not so long after that occurs to one that one decides to take advantage of it in order to manipulate that discord between interpretation and the inner object for one's own purposes. Not long after that, the Hobbesian war of all against all ironically returns as a play of individualities with one another in which each and all find themselves both deceiving and deceived, despite the fact that this section began with the hope of having the work provide a perfect reflection of one's inner intent as a literal externalization of subjectivity into objectivity. This section ends, though, with the realization that this dystopia of universal mutual deceit had stemmed simply from a misunderstanding of the nature of the universal matter in hand itself. This universal is not one which is dealt with by the honest or dishonest individual alone, but is always an inherently public sphere. Painting, for example, is not merely my painting, because it is a universal subject matter which everyone else is free to enter into and explore with no hardwired limit on the number of participants who could inhabit the same space. Unwittingly, then, we have just returned to the ethical substance, and for that very reason, the next section will take up the problem of morality, which was, of course, lacking in this particular section. So thank you once again. I look forward to the next video.